Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are again going to release this just a tiny bit late, but it is for a good cause once again. As promised, we have rejoining us on the podcast, um, the esteemed grandmaster, author, broadcaster, and popular YouTube presenter, Daniel King. Daniel, how are you holding up? I'm I'm doing really well. I'm back. I'm at home. <laughs> so yes, that's yes. I'm doing, doing really well and, and actually kind of enjoying the spring weather and course you know i mean london and well the country is now basically in some kind of lockdown um but it's nice to be home i can tell you yeah absolutely crazy times we're recording this on march 24th 2020 two weeks after our last interview last interview and it, it feels like an eternity daniel <laughs> well yeah and, and at that time when we recorded that i was set to go off to yekaterinburg in a few days after that and as as uh, a commentator there and you know i was still determined to go and basically with a day to go on the friday um i pulled the plug one day before i was due to travel because like every day the situation was just escalating and you know i was just getting more and more stressed about it and um yeah by the time it got to day before my flight uh i yeah, I, I'm afraid I had to cancel. And um, well, with every day that goes by, it was obviously the right decision. Yeah, I think it was definitely the right decision. And which brings us to the candidates. So we're going to discuss this for a while. So and try to get this out quickly for listeners. But any listeners who are listening to this months or years later, I'll put the timestamp. And if you want to skip all the candidates talk, because who knows, there'll be more info on the story if you're listening later. But um, we just have to talk about it a bit. So number one, um, you mentioned it looks like it was the right decision to postpone it. How are you feeling about uh, FIDE's decision to carry on with the tournament so far? Well, yes, yeah, so far is that's, <laughs> that's well qualified um, because we're at round six now. We've just completed six rounds and the tournament is still going on. We're, we're speaking on the free day, but... You know, if they called it off now, I would completely understand, you know, how they can play properly with everything mm. that's going on in the background. You know, there's so much uncertainty. They don't know whether they're going to be, well, ha- how some of them are going to get home, you know, because there are, there are travel restrictions now. Um, it's simply that, to have that in the back of your head. But also, there is some degree of infection when you're sitting opposite someone for a few hours. You know, these are exactly the wrong conditions. Um, And although to some extent the players are self-isolating and they're given medical checks a couple of times a day, but still, you know, I've seen photos um, of the playing hall and, but also the people working around it, you know, there are photographers, there are arbiters. Now, I just don't believe that they can strictly control everyone there. So there is no doubt that the players have some risk, perhaps still very small, but there is some risk. And I think to to play under those conditions is extremely difficult. Now, it's the player's decision in combination with FIDE. But if the players decided... Sorry, this is just too much. I would completely understand. Yeah, and of course, uh, Wang Hao has been vocal about that, not only before the tournament, but during the tournament. And Alexander Grushuk, uh, after not the mm. not yesterday's round, but the round before, also said he, at first he wasn't sure if he had an opinion, but now he feels quite strongly. And he, he even dropped a cool quote from Botvinnik. He said... Uh, Botvinnik has said that if you make two players play while standing, it's not it's completely unsure that the same one will win as if they played while sitting. Um, which speaks- I really like that actually. It's a very it's a very odd image, and and you know perhaps some people would say, well, you know, you can't compare the two. But okay, I know what he means. Yeah, 
these conditions are so strange that who knows well of course there's no control we can we can never go back in time but it's just very odd to be playing under these circumstances yeah i mean i know like in sports people like to sort of be macho or show bravado and say you know the competitors are playing under the same circumstances but this is yep. a this is a bit beyond the pale in my opinion and i'm immensely enjoying the chess so <laughs> you know it's not um nothing to do with the chess but it just seems from a human perspective it's it's more important um uh, absolutely no I, I completely agree you know in many ways this is such a welcome distraction but what the players are going through now the other thing is it's not just about their safety they all have family and friends back home wherever they are and you know that is really worrying i mean apart from my own safety and health going out to Yekaterinburg, you know, I have family back here. Um, and I'm not just talking about my wife and kids. I'm talking about my parents. You know, as far as I can, I want to look after them. How these players can play when they've, they've got family who are in some risk or need some help, that is so difficult. I mean, really. Yeah. And then if something happens, I mean, God forbid. Exactly. Yeah. So... It's a, it's, it's not it's, just about them. It's about other people as well. Yeah. And have you heard anything, Daniel, about why FIDE was... I mean, of course, it's every, it's easy in hindsight, but a lot of people yeah. were, were first guessing. Uh, of course, um, um, Rajabov himself, obviously, refusing to play under these conditions um, is, uh, comes to light. And of course, some people have said, well, if it gets postponed, what, what happens to Rajabov since he rightfully would have been in it? But anyway, did you hear anything about why FIDE was so gung ho to to carry the tournament on, um, even as this uh, virus got scarier and scarier? Yeah, I did hear hear from from one of the guys, Frida. I don't particularly want to say who, but um, one of the top guys um, who basically said, "Look, we've got a really difficult decision here. You know, it's 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 not like they were just going, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. You know, I, I think the problem was that." As I said, the situation has escalated so quickly. You know, day-to-day situation changed. And, you know, f- compared with two weeks ago, how people were acting, I'm just talking about London, how people were acting two weeks ago to how people are acting now, it is quite extraordinary, um, and rightly so. Um, so basically, FIDE decided... And I think it was a really close call. Look, everyone's there. We've got everyone there. We let's go ahead. It's as simple as that, you know. Yeah. So early but on, they had a real dilemma. They had a real dilemma. So they took an initial decision not to postpone it, and then once things got more dire, it was harder to postpone it. Uh, well, maybe, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm not sure about you know their thoughts over the last you know running up exactly. But all I can say is, yeah, with, say, a couple of weeks to go before the event, they decided we are going to carry this through. Wow. And they put in place, you know, the the medical checks and that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Well, and we're, again, we're recording this March 24th. Uh, Hopefully people will listen soon, but it's very fluid. I mean, Romain Edward, Grandmaster Edward tweeted yesterday that he's hearing it's going to be postponed uh uh jan napomnici the tournament leader which we'll get to in a minute didn't seem to be in the best of health so who knows what's going to happen but it'll be you know there'll be more information shortly but then even when the tournament continues it's like it's frustrating every round we're like is there going to be a round the next day we're not sure yeah no i mean really it's it's um it's a terrible situation it really is i mean i suppose you know if they did postpone then the knock-on effect is obviously would the world championship match in Dubai be in jeopardy then? Right. It's in December. Would they have time to actually rerun or resume the the tournament? I mean, I think they have said that if someone got ill, then they would simply um, adjourn the tournament. Everyone would keep their scores up to a certain point, but then they would try to resume the tournament at some later date when presumably everyone would be well. Um, so in that way, I think 
to me, reading between the lines, that kind of excludes Rajabov, if you see what I mean. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and Fide, I, I had, um, you know, I've been watching so many recaps. Yours have been awesome. Um, uh, Jesse Cry, I've enjoyed his his recaps for Chess Dojo. I've been in been enjoying um, Jakob Agard for US Chess. Is doing great recaps. It's just uh, it's such boom times for for um, chess content. Um, mm-hmm. But in in Jakob Agard's US Chess. Um, Recap, he mentioned that he had heard part of the reason that, that Fide was so enthusiastic to carry on this event was because of the, the finances that would be generated from the World Championship later this year. So, um, Well, I mean, that, that, that makes perfect sense, of course. I mean, um, and, and, you know, they've got the, the, the match set up in, in Dubai, um, whether, and it's coinciding with the, the Dubai Expo. But, I mean, who knows what the world is going to look like uh, by the time we get to December, I mean, yeah, yeah. They, certainly, you know, the chances of any kind of um, vaccine appearing uh, by the end of the year are actually very slim, as far as you know, medical opinion says. Uh, so, you know, under the, simply under those circumstances, would it be wise to be holding a match in 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 the middle of Dubai Expo? Um, and so on, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a very strong call. I, money is a problem, of course. But I think there is a there is a very strong call for saying, look, okay, we should postpone this by a year. I mean, I'm again, you know, you 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 time stamped this, yeah. this interview, which I think is important because at the moment, the IOC are debating whether to actually postpone the Tokyo Olympics. I um, think, yeah, I think I saw which that it it's seems inevitable. delayed. Yeah, I think it's a it's been reported. I don't know if it's been confirmed. Um, but let's talk about the chess a little bit, just and yes, please. And, <laughs> yeah, and we'll try not to. We'll try to be relatively uh, coronavirus free here for the rest yeah. of the show. I mean, it's. A P, I know I certainly could use a distraction, and I'm guessing a lot of people feel the same way. Sure. Um, so we're six rounds in. Uh, Jan Napomnici with an awesome showing so far, is in the clear lead with four and a half out of six. MVL has that's my Grandmaster Maxime Vashir Lagrave has three and a half out of six. Uh, um, on even scores with three out of six are Caruana, Giri, Wang Hao, and Grishuk. And then uh, bringing up the rear with two out of six are Ding Liren and Alexenko. So, Daniel, I'm going to start with the uh, classic journalist question of uh, what has surprised you so far um, with the chess, <laughs> with the chess of so far in this tournament? Well, obviously, Ding's performance, which it is quite extraordinary that in the six games he's played so far, he has lost three of them. And, you know, we were waxing lyrical in our preview about, yeah, ding, super <laughs> solid. That 100-game yeah. um, streak w- without losing three games. Two out of six, two and a half points behind Nepo. Is he out of it? Well, not quite yet, but if he doesn't put a, a little streak of wins in in over the next few rounds he could just be out of it i mean to come back from this i mean this is obviously the biggest surprise um of, of the tournament so far um and i have to say looking at some of those defeats he just didn't look himself at all i mean we've just come off yesterday where he lost to to Nepo. Now, Nepo, I thought, played a really great game. He's on great form. We'll talk about him in a second, I'm sure. But um, the way Ding lost, I don't know. He's how he, he went into a middle game, which was basically dubious. This move knight d4 with this fixed pawn on d4 and a dark square. I just think strategically, positionally, if something goes wrong there, which it did, he's just kind of lost actually because there's this bad bishop blocked by that pawn on d4. Um, and that didn't look right to me. And his game against MVL uh, crushed in that Spanish. I mean, a, a really horrible loss actually against Maxime. Um, you know, the, the bright... Point, the bright spot from his viewpoint of obviously is his win against uh, Fabiano and and that was a really good game and we thought ah oh, yeah he's back and then yeah so ding yeah he has 
Yeah, it's disappointing to see. And I mean, of course, some people are offering potential potential reasons why he may not in be peak form. But again, all the players are dealing with the same stuff. And someone's, mm-hmm. someone's going to have a bad tournament. And unfortunately, so far, it's him. Yeah. But, yeah. but Nepo is... So um, do you feel... So he's four and a half out of six. Do you feel that... Uh, from the quality of his games, do you feel like he's playing at a higher level than normally? Um, I mean, he's always had this in him. What do you think, Daniel? Um, we know that he's capable of, of beating anyone in the world, including the world champion. Uh, so I wouldn't say he's playing at a higher level. Uh, I just think, you know, he, he's capable of that. We know that already. And I have to say, I'm really impressed by his play. Um, I mean, his, his win against Geary in that first round was absolutely superb uh, to be caught in some absolutely vicious opening preparation, a line that was really unclear, very difficult to find your way through this. And actually he negotiated that transition from the opening into the middle game, which I think is notoriously tricky phase. He did that so well, kept control and turned it around. And to win that, I thought that was absolutely brilliant. I mean, we couldn't talk about his other wing uh, wins. Um, yeah, but beautiful end game technique too. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, but but that whole thing of being caught in the opening, but still turning it around. And and yeah, you're right. His technique was was actually perfect. <laughs> Yeah, it's impressive stuff. Um, and yep. of course, round seven uh, will be MVL with White against Napomnici. So that's for now. That's the game of the tournament: first place and yeah. second place. Yes, and point difference between them, um, which is already you know that's quite significant considering it's just their first and second uh, kind of on their own, and then as you say, a clump on fifty percent with three. Um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting. But, I I mean, Maxime has played okay so far. I have to say, I haven't been overly impressed. He's done all right. But I think, you know, we mentioned his limitations. And I think uh, in the preview, and I think they're, they're coming, kind of becoming clear. His opening repertoire, as we mentioned, is very narrow. And you can see already that players are targeting him. So... You know, in the last round, he had this draw against Wang Hao. Now, fine, he held a, a, a tough end game in the Grunfeld. But, you know, that's hard work. If he's going to have to do that for most of his games, holding or with, you know, with Black at any rate, you know, holding difficult positions, at some point you crack. Um, so... Yeah, I th- I find it very hard to believe that he's going to pull through and and win this tournament. I have to say, just judging by what's what's happened so far. Um, but as you say, round seven, we've got um, Maxime against Nepo, so we shall see. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with your overall analysis of the tournament um, of of his prospects it does make his repertoire issues make it a challenge but if he can just win this one game it reopens the tournament significantly puts yeah him, puts him on four and a half and anyone in the three cluster who wins is only half a point back so we yeah, will well, see although well that's true you know to to my to my mind i still think that uh caruana has uh, a decent chance actually um although yeah, he's he's disappointed so far, but if he gets a you know a streak of, of wins together, you know he could still be in there. Yeah, and he's of course famed for some streaks, so yeah, well, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't be too surprising. So yeah, so whenever whenever this continues, possibly tomorrow, <laughs> possibly later, uh, we, we it'll be fun to watch. I mean, it's just I love this tournament so much. That's so um, it's just it's. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, I, you go know, ahead. I, couldn't couldn't agree more. I mean, for me, the candidates is just the event in the chess calendar. Um, I mean, the World Championship match is in itself something very, very different. But from all of other tournaments, it is just shows players. It really exposes players. And, and I, I mean that 
in the sense that it shows brings the best and it brings the worst out of people as well um it's great yeah, yeah. really enjoying it yeah it, it's good stuff so whenever it happens we'll look forward to it um but let's move on daniel i mean you've got yeah. a lot a lot more to your career than just uh just dissecting the candidates so yeah. <laughs> so you've got a new book out um uh, called Sultan Khan, the Indian servant who became chess champion of the British Empire. Um, Snappy I, title, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, Daniel, I have to admit. I mean, so you, you had mentioned you spent six years working on this title, and and I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, but there's an excerpt available in New in Chess Magazine. Uh, two things about that. Number one, New in Chess Magazine graciously made their, I believe it's February issue, their most recent issue with Fabiano on the cover, is free in digital format for anyone who gets their app. And of course, I've uh, sung the virtues of New in Chess, and a lot of listeners don't need to hear me sing the virtues of it. But for any listeners who aren't familiar, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, the chess analysis is quite high level for anyone wondering, but I mean, there's great interviews and great features and great tournament recaps and something for everyone. So uh, I'll link to where you can check that out. But also, if if you don't have an iPad and you just want to read the preview, there's also a link to the preview. I mean, uh, sorry, um, an excerpt of Grandmaster King's book about Sultan Khan um, on the New and Chess webpage where the book will be sold. And and Daniel, as I was starting to say, I was, um, I mean, I don't want to say skeptical, but I, when, when I read the title, I, I wasn't, it's not, if we weren't having this interview, it's not a book I would immediately be, be lining up to buy, but I did read the excerpt, uh, Daniel, and I was totally hooked. It's just an, an amazing story and the, the writing was great. So now I'm ready to pre-order it. Thank you. Well, actually that article wasn't, wasn't an excerpt. It was actually a kind of pricey ah, of okay. part, part of the book. There was one part of it. There was a, a small excerpt, but it was kind of, yeah, it was a pricey of the book actually. Um, so the title of the book is Sultan Khan, and then there's a strap line, which I won't repeat again, but let's just <laughs> let's stick with Sultan Khan. So I became fascinated by this player. It, it's a biography, um, but also, you know, I look at his games as well. So let me just give you a, a quick, quick overview. So Sultan Khan was from India. He came to London in 1929. Um, and virtually unknown, and within a, a few months had won the British Championship. Um, he played in tournaments in Europe for the next few years, and then at the end of 1933, he left Europe and returned to India, and very little was heard of him again. So he's really mysterious. You know, why did he come to England? How was he able to play so well when he'd really played in very few tournaments. Um, and why did he suddenly return to India? You know, all these questions, and what happened to him then? You know, all these questions, you know, I wanted to to find out about. And I, I've i always known about this story, but uh, a few things came together a, a few years ago, and I started, well, just for my own interest, researching and the more I looked into it, the more I realized that actually there's a lot to, still to be discovered about him. Um, and whenever I've, whenever I've had time over the last few years, I've been going up to the absolutely magnificent British Library, um, which is in fairly central in London, and researching contemporary newspapers and magazines of that time you know, from the late 20s and, and early 30s. And, you know, I discovered loads of new stuff about him. And the thing is, there is, there is a big political story behind Sultan Khan. And, and that's what I really got into. And, and really, it's, it's the only way to understand why he turned up in London um, and why he left, actually. So without giving away too much of the book, um, how, wh what's the answer? <laughs> is that too, okay, uh, yeah. is that too, the, um, too much the, information? Yeah. The, the problem is, you know, as you said, I've spent the last six years on and off, I should say, uh, researching and writing, and, you know, trying to condense this into kind of six minutes is really, I yeah, find really like tough. 360 page uh, book, something like that. Yeah. Three, 380. Yeah. Once I start talking, um, I don't stop because I've 
just became gripped by it. Um, it's amazing. So th- there's a, f- a few things. Um, he was basically part of the household of um, this this Indian narwhab. Uh, so one one of the, the a very rich man, a politician in India. So that's not Nawab uh, Sir Umar Hayat Khan, Colonel Nawab Sir Umar Hayat Khan, who was one of the had incredible land holdings in the Punjab, huge estates, um, very rich uh, politician. He was a member of the Indian Upper House, um, and he was also quite a keen chess player. And he, when he recognised Sultan Khan's talent, Sultan Khan, I should say, was not a sultan. Um, he actually came from a very small village, um, very modest background. and But he was taken into the household of Sir Umar Hayat Khan, who basically brought in the best coaches in India to teach him the Western game because he played an Indian form of the game. And when he was ready, Sir Umar Hayat Khan decided, OK, I'm going to take him to Europe. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't just that. Basically, Sir Umar Hayat Khan was on a political mission uh, in in London, the cent- centre of the, the 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 empire, the British Empire, of course. Because as a Muslim, uh, Sir Umar Hayat Khan actually felt um, that his position in society, which was very privileged, was actually in some danger because he feared Indian independence. Okay, so we, it's getting complicated. <laughs> mm. um, so at that time, of course, in the 1920s, the Indian independence movement was growing. You know, if you think of Gandhi was the uh, head of um, the Indian National Congress who really spearheaded this this movement, which was a kind of pan, um, pan-national pan movement, pan-religious movement. Um, but... Actually, many people perceived this as a kind of Hindu organization, and they feared with Indian independence that Hindus would dominate. I'm talking about the Muslim population here, which was, you know, about, well, let's say roughly a third of the population of India. But they feared Hindu dominance and they feared independence to some extent. Um, And basically, Sir Umar Hayat Khan was on a political mission to Britain to state the Muslim case. Not just that, um, he was also a recruiter for the for the British Army as well. Um, but basically, to sort of state his position as a, and, and say, "Look, we're important here. Uh, you need we need safeguards." Um, and he became an advisor to the British government, and to some extent, his his political mission was. Uh, very successful, but he used Sultan Khan as kind of soft, kind of soft diplomacy. He actually, mm. you know, Sultan Khan attracted a lot of publicity, and between the pair of them, they actually, you know, managed to put over their case extremely well. I'm sorry, that was very long. <laughs> no, but the, I'm I'm hooked. It's it's really interesting. I mean, one of my favorite things about chess history is how it it kind of ducks in and out of real life history. So so well, when you sorry go ahead. Yeah, sorry. You no you go ahead. Oh go so so yeah when when you're reading this you learn other things as well but I mean of course the topic of most interest to to me personally is chess so it's it's just fascinating to hear. I and I, and I should say that this is a book about chess. <laughs> but yeah, running, good games. Running through it, I state the political context, which is actually really important to understand the story. So that's in the background, but it is basically about Sultan Khan, how he learnt Western chess, how he played Western chess, who against whom he played, um, you know, his his best games, his best successes, his disasters. Um, who he met, you know, of course, he played against Alikin, he played against Capablanca, he played against the leading players of the day, and what happened to him on the chessboard. So, you know, that's in the forefront, but the political context is there in the background as well. 
Yeah, and a uh, couple Capablanca games in the excerpt, the one where he hangs his queen, but then the second game was, was something. I mean, that was um, that was an impressive win by Sultan Khan. Well, the his win against Capablanca from Hastings in 1930, 1931 is very well known, um, at least to, well, to some of us, very well known, <laughs> known and, and is a classic. It's a beautiful game. And actually very much in Sultan Khan's style, he was quite a positional player, quite a strategic player. Um, and he outplayed Capablanca strategically. And it's, it is an absolute masterpiece. As uh, Capablanca himself said as- afterwards, you know, he was, he was very fulsome in his praise towards Sultan Khan and actually said of Sultan Khan that con- he said, considering that Sultan Khan learned, only learned the Western game so late, you know, he played Indian chess the, his, his whole life, then he said he's a genius. Um, but what I discovered in this book was that actually a, just a couple of days after Sultan Khan arrived in London, he played Capablanca in a simultaneous display. This is the incredible thing. And you can you imagine <laughs> that Kappa would have to face Sultan Khan, who became, you know, a, a really strong player, but no one knew how strong Sultan Khan was. Mm-hmm. So two days after Sultan Khan arrived in London, he was there in a playing along with well a, a symbol of 35 players <laughs> right. against kappa he was one of 35 and i managed to discover this game i dug it out of some some old newspaper i couldn't believe it when i saw it um and it's it's a pretty decent game um and basically in a very messy position kappa hangs his queen um you know, uh, as usual, Sultan Khan played a disastrous opening because he simply he didn't know uh, traditional openings very well at all. Had a bad opening. Kappa obviously thought, right, I'm going in for the kill because Sultan Khan's king was wandering all over the center of the board. That's another thing that Sultan Khan consistently underestimated Um his the, the problems with his own king because in in the indian game they didn't play they didn't castle or they had a different form of castling and so he often left his king in the middle of the board way too late so in this game against kappa his king is wandering around the middle of the board and kappa just goes for the kill right but somehow one of sultan khan's great strengths was his focus and his concentration and he managed to to just about hang on and in a position which was simply very unclear, Kappa hung his queen. Yeah, and, so- and of course, yeah, oh, it, it was a simul, we should remind listeners. And yes. It, and it can be tricky doing a simul, especially like Kasparov, um, I, I heard somewhere when he would when he was doing a simul, even if he didn't know the players, he would ask, like, who should I be looking out for? You yeah. know, at least have some idea of... Uh, which games you should be particularly dialed in on. Because if you're just autopiloting every game and you don't know uh, where the, the landmines are, it can be it can be tricky to just never make a blunder. So Absolutely. I, I, I must admit, I do exactly the same when I'm playing a simul. Yeah. You know, I, I like to know who the best players are. Otherwise, um, yeah, it, you're never sure. Because sometimes you play against someone and you think, hang on, they looks like they know some theory (laughs) and uh, and and sometimes you can be fooled by that um yeah it's really weird yeah but in some sense that's good if they can at least tip you off early whereas sultan khan's playing the opening badly and then then starting to play well um but yeah an amazing story that he ends up playing um playing him on equal terms in in short order i mean just exactly so yeah so that was um less than two years after that that was about yeah, just over a year and a half after that, yeah. um, that they were they actually played over the board. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's just one of you know so many stories. You know, he he played against uh, Alikin, of course. Um, I mean, there was I think there was a kind of six month period after he beat Kappa in Hastings, so that was at the the, the end of nineteen thirty, beginning of nineteen thirty one, and. 
he had six months where he played incredibly well. Directly after that Hastings tournament, he traveled to Austria where he faced Tartakova. Now, Tartakova at that time was, well, you know, he was a professional player for a start um, and was probably at the peak of his career. And he was incredibly experienced in, in European tournaments. And Sultan Khan defeated him in a 12-game match. Went down to the final game, game 12. It was even, and Sultan Khan won that final game. Now, that is a really big achievement. Yeah, uh- it's an amazing story. I'm, I'm excited for the book. So Daniel, I was ready to order it when I read the excerpt last night, but then the only thing that, that gave me, that made me pause was, um, as a Patreon subscriber of, of your content, um, <laughs> it occurred to me that maybe you were going to do some kind of book promotion. So I thought I should at least ask just in case there were going to be any like signed versions for sale or anything like that. Um, I, do you know I, what? I, w- I would love to do that, but unfortunately <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Um, maybe at a later date, but right, not not right now. Yeah, I don't think I can do it right now. Not going to be um, making a bunch of trips to the post office, Daniel. <laughs> well, well, that's the whole thing. They've just announced that. Yeah, they're basically closing closing the post office, which is not not great. So yeah, I, for well, I I don't think I'd be allowed to do it full stop. But yeah, for for practical reasons, unfortunately, I can't do that. But yeah, it's it's possible to pre order it. Um, it it will be released at the beginning of April. Uh, well, at least. That that's what I hear. I mean, I I hope there's no uh, difficulty with the supply chain, um, but should be out beginning of April. You can order it directly from newinchest.com, um, or you can get it from Amazon or whatever. So yeah, yeah looking, hopefully it'll be out soon. Looking now, it says Amazon will release it on April fifteenth, two thousand twenty. Um, okay. and yeah, pre-ordering helps the authors. So uh, listeners, um. Do your part if you are a fan like I am of uh, Grandmaster King's content. And and uh, the foreword is by uh, Vishwanathan Anand, um, which I'm looking forward to reading. But then I, uh, it, I read somewhere before I interviewed Grandmaster Anand recently, I believe I read that you gave him the nickname Vishy, but then I couldn't track it down in, in preparation for this interview. Is that a confirmed or unconfirmed rumor, or did I just make that up, Daniel? Um, do you know what? Several people claim it. Um, I'm not going to claim it, um, but, you know, Vichy in his early years spent quite a lot of time in England and uh, he was very popular. You know, we all got to know him very well. Um, you know, that was a time when I was professional. There were, you know, players like uh, Mickey Adams and Julian Hodgson. And, you know, we were kind of all, you know, a bit of a, a band of warriors together and, and, you know, Vichy spent time here and, you know, everything gets shortened and we used to call him Vichy and it kind of stuck. I think Vichy said that, um, Maya Chibodnitsa kind of christened him Vichy, but I, 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 which is quite possible, but I don't know. All I can say is in, in, in England, we always call them Vichy. Okay. I'm not going to claim it, though. I think it was just in the air. You know, it was inevitable. We'll let others claim it uh, on your behalf or, yeah, uh, former women's world champion. Um, Yeah. uh, But what what I will say, it was it was great that Vichy wrote forward and it was it was very nice. It was uh, it was quite, quite personal talking. You know, he was comparing his own career with Sultan Khan's, which was which was really nice. But also it was really good of Vichy because at that time he was just finishing off his own book. Um, he didn't need to do this for me. Uh, yeah. So big, really, you know, very, very generous guy, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but just let me come back to the book because this for me has been an absolute passion. And I, I love the story of Sultan Khan. And I would not have spent so long researching and writing this book if what I discovered was he was a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there, no one has a bad word to say about Sultan Khan. You know, at, in those days, it wasn't the, the kind of years of celebrity interviews in, in magazines or online. Um, but just occasionally, someone kind of drops a personal comment about Sultan Khan. And they're always commenting, he's very modest, um, he's, he's very charming, he's unassuming, um, and he just comes across really well. And... His whole situation where he was kind of 
he was part of this household. He had, I mean, you can either call Sir Umar Hayat Khan his patron or his master, you know, depending on how much control. He was kind of controlled to some extent. Um, and, you know, I kind of felt quite sorry for his for him. He was given so many chances to, you know, to play chess. And, you know, he was funded by his patron, Sir Umar. Um, but, of course, he must have felt as though he was kind of performing for his master as well. And it must have been extremely difficult. Um, so, yeah, there are so many aspects of this story that I was interested in, but not least his talent, but also his, I think, a really nice personality as well. Excellent. Well, looking forward to, to reading it as soon as um, as it arrives. So, Daniel, there's a couple other topics I'd like to to talk about but first we're going to take a break to hear from chessable with the eyes of the chess world on the fide candidates tournament i wanted to draw your attention to two fun things going on at chessable number one gm pentalic harry krishna's game of the day videos are absolutely free at chessable they also have a free learning course from all these great games taking place in a katarina berg and number two chessable has a fide candidate sale going on lots of bargains including discounts on fight like magnus Ginger GM courses, Fight E4 like Caruana, Lifetime Repertoires, the Nimzo Ragozin. So you can go to chessable.com and check all this stuff out. The sale lasts for about another 12 days from March 24th. Okay, we are back. And Daniel, I wanted to talk a little bit about your YouTube channel, um, if you're up for it. And we... Um, sure. We actually have a related question from, I mean, first of all, again, for listeners, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, Daniel does a great job, but it's a great mix of um, uh, brevity and uh, you always learn something. I mean, there's great analysis, great opening perspective. So highly recommend Power Play Chess. Um, so um, a listener of the podcast, Martin Vanderhid, I actually forgot to paste the name, but I believe that's it. Um, has two questions for you, Dan. So the first one is not is only tangentially related to the question to the YouTube channel, but he says, um, "Hi, hi, Ben. I'm curious why Daniel speaks German, not something you see with a lot of English people." So we'll start with that one. Okay. Well, that sort of takes me back to to my chess career, uh, where I started in the mid 1980s playing in the German National League, the German Bundesliga. And for me, that was a real watershed in my um, chess career because, uh, you know, I was kind of bumming around on the circuit and having a, having a good time in my, my early 20s. Um, it, was, it was an adventure, basically. You know, I, you can't compare it with a kind of serious professional. It was, it was an adventure, you know, traveling around, you know, it was all a bit fast and loose. Um, but as soon as I started playing for a club in the German National League, then it got really serious because suddenly I felt this sense of responsibility. <laughs> you know, I'm playing for my team, my teammates, and they were really encouraging. I really enjoyed it. And suddenly I started studying a bit. You know, I was already an IM, but somehow, do you know what? That kind of, that was pretty easy. Nothing, it came, yeah, without too much study. But suddenly, Bundesliga, serious opponents, serious preparation. And, you know, I would go out to Germany for, for like, I don't know how many weekends, eight, eight or nine weekends in a season. And I just thought, well, you know, I may as well learn, learn something here. I've always been interested in languages. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll learn some. Um, and, yeah, basically, that's how I learned German. You know. Wow. And how is your German pretty good? Uh, it's fluent. Wow. It's not, per it's not perfect, but it's fluent. I Excellent. mean, I, I've done reports for Der Spiegel, uh, video reports for Der Spiegel, uh, which is the, I suppose, one of the, the most well-established news websites in Germany. And if they're happy, so I guess it's all right. Excellent. Um, and the, the second half of the question, um, Martin Vanderhood asks, he says, uh, Agad Mater's channel has 10 times the amount of subscribers compared to Power Play Chess. Uh, I love both channels, and I'd like to know if Daniel has an explanation for the difference. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're, we're obviously um, 
looking at different different audiences here. I mean, I mean, I think you know my analysis is is not directed at beginners. That's quite clear. Um, so where there's an interesting moment, I like to delve into it, and um, you know I try to explain as much as possible. But basically, I kind of please myself. You know, um, if if I'm looking at a game and I think, wow, that's a really interesting moment, uh, I go into it. <laughs> but probably, you know, by the time I'm into um, Variation 2, then, you know, I, I've, I've lost a whole chunk of audience. So maybe that's an explanation. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the potential audience of, of people who just know the basics of chess as compared to someone who can follow your video is just a, a great large difference but we're very grateful yeah. that you do that you do these um these uh you know more advanced videos and and i i have a ton of respect for for antonio's uh content i mean he's bringing so many new fans into the chess world that i think they both of you occupy an important place well that's that's nice to hear <laughs> <laughs> no i mean the thing is i mean having said that mine is at a more advanced level uh yes but you know, I like to think, you know, I, I know a lot of people watching my videos who um, are uh, pretty basic players. You know, this is not, we're not talking at some, you know, su super club level here. Um, it's, yeah, basically, I think if you, if you know the moves and, and you're you're interested and you, and you want to um, find out a bit about top level chess, then I think they're still suitable. Yeah, I agree. I mean, because as you mentioned, the moments where you dive deep are one or two moments a game. Um, and other than that, it's you, you gain some opening perspective. You learn a little bit about the players and that stuff that, that exactly. anyone, anyone can, um, can appreciate. Um, and how many years ago did you, uh, did you start your YouTube channel, Daniel? I mean, obviously you've been making videos for, for decades, but um yeah i think it was 2012 i'm kind of losing track actually was it or 2012 or 20 no it must have been 2013 there you go that that's really poor when i don't even know myself <laughs> maybe it was 2013 I, i'm sure someone will tell me um you, you know i just thought i was you know i've i've been presenting chess in videos but not just in videos um but for tv for years you know in 1990 i was reporting doing video doing reports uh, on tv um for the world championship match in 1990 um and you know i've worked on, for the bbc uh, well for espn for eurosport for stations all over the world um but of course terrestrial tv uh, i mean it seems you know really old hat this was before the internet in the early nineties, um, that you know, you don't get chess on on terrestrial TV now, of course. Um, so when that work dried up, I started doing videos for for chess base, uh, DVDs or digital downloads as they are now. Um, but I thought, look, this is my forte. <laughs> I should be using this. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm used to sitting in front of a camera and talking about the game, so that's why I set up my channel basically. Yeah, Sagar Shah of uh, Chessbase India absolutely adores your uh, power play series from Chessbase. That that's very nice for him. Yeah, Sag Sagar's been very very complimentary, and yeah, I mean that started in 2006, a long long time ago, um, and I mean you know to put it bluntly that was another reason why I started the channel because I wanted to promote my DVDs, which I, which I think are good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, if people want to go deeper into the game and actually get something that is more instructional, more didactic, if you want to learn a particular opening, if you want to look at a particular middle game topic, then I direct people towards my, um, my power play series from chess base. Um, yeah, how many are in the series? Do you remember offhand? I know. Yeah, it's twenty six. Actually, a twenty seventh is about to appear. Wow, that that is impressive. Um, yeah, of course, I want to talk about number twenty seven. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. 
so it's on the king's gambit you know i've been looking um at really a solid opening repertoire um which you can really trust in you know i've been looking at the night off for black the queen's gambit declined for black you know these were my favorite openings when i played and i thought okay let's have a bit of fun here um so of course it's my name i've got to play the king's gambit right and as a teenager, that was actually, you know, I did play it a lot until kind of sensible chess took over and, and, I, and I took up, of course, the Spanish. Um, but I used to play the King's Gambit and it was great fun going back and looking at all these old lines and, and actually seeing how they developed since, since I stopped playing. I probably, you know, probably last played the King's Gambit when I was about 19 or 20. So I haven't looked at it properly since then. And with actually players like Morozevich, uh, Nigel Short, Ponomaryov, these guys have been playing the King's Gambit and found some really interesting stuff. So actually, I'm, I'm really excited about this. So basically, I've put together a repertoire for white. Um, and yeah, I if you want to have some fun, go for it. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had Jan Gustafsson. He's a he's a friend of mine, so I interviewed him a few months ago, and he likes to to stoke the fire of the King's Gambit lovers. He he likes to talk about whether whether White is worse after two F four or just equal, you know. Um, so, but I totally. I mean, it is a fun. It's a fun opening, and um, definitely. I mean, your opponents are not likely to know it super well, so um, you can really catch them off guard. Well, that's the thing. It's complexity. And, you know, you get, you know, you're, you're on, you're there in down the club on a Friday night and suddenly your opponent bangs out two F4 and you kind of go, Oh yeah, yeah. Somebody said there was a refutation. Now what the hell was it? <laughs> right. And I'm like, I mean, I, I've looked at these so-called reputations and like five or six moves in from the start of the game, suddenly we're talking only moves you know, this is the only move to get an advantage. Now, hang on. Was that move six or move seven? Right. Oh, blimey. Was it the knight or the bishop first? You know, it's jeopardy right from move two, basically. And, yeah, these so-called refutations, well, really, yeah. If you're playing a computer against a computer, absolutely. But, you know, for most others, you're probably not going to see it in the candidates. But when you see, when you have players like Nigel Short, uh, Morozevich, Ponomaryov, and many others, yeah, I think Adiban who, played it at some point. Adi, Adiban played it. Um, I mean, many others. Okay, even that's at twenty six, twenty seven hundred level. But okay, if we if we just go below that, it's. I mean, there are some guys out, out there who make a living from it. You know, there are there are a few IMs. Um, and GMs who are using the King's Gambit regularly on the, on the tournament circuit and actually doing extremely well for, well from it. Okay, so the the debate remains open. King's Gambit aficionados take heart. Um, um, and, go, sorry, go ahead. To, sorry, I'm sorry, Ben. I'm interrupting. I oh do no, no, that's that's. Uh, I, I I don't think the debate remains open <laughs> at, at the highest level. <laughs> I mean, what's Yan talking about? <laughs> you know, it's it's should be better for black. Um, but everything, you know, we're not playing with computers. Yeah. That's the point. It's the complexity which just blows people away. That was an important clarification. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, okay. So Daniel, my kids are a ticking time bomb. Um, okay. <laughs> these, these days we're recording uh, with, um, you know, uh, my kids are suddenly being air quotes homeschooled usually actually homeschool, just not at this moment. But um, right. <laughs> right now, right now, all is quiet. So I'd like to try to bang out a couple more topics if you're okay. You're, sure. Okay, great. So you're also, um, you have an upcoming project with Chessable um, uh, with more of a beginning course coming out in April. I'm scrolling through my outline to find the title, oh, Tournament Ready. Um, so could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so this really is for players that... Um, know how the pieces move, but really nothing else. So this was put together by Alex and Sarah Longson, 
who are a couple here in uh, England who run something called the UK Chess Challenge, which is a huge tournament for school kids. And they have about 70,000 kids playing in this competition wow. every year. So what it is, they basically set this thing up through schools. Schools run their own competition on their own. And then the winners of those school competitions go forward to regional finals, which they set up. So it's completely UK wide, United Kingdom wide. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic um, initiative. It's a fantastic tournament. And then, you know, you go from these regional tournaments until there's, you know, the grand mega final. Um, this is actually set up by by Michael, Mike Basman, a uh, well, a, a legend in yeah. English chess, um, but Alex and Sarah Longson, who are a really dynamic uh, couple, they've they've taken it on now and doing a fantastic job with it. So it was their idea uh, to actually provide something, material, learning material for um, those kids who know the moves, but really nothing else. And they devised the course, and I stepped in, and I you know, recorded some explanatory videos. Um, and Sarah, Sarah Longson also has recorded some, some videos for it as well. So that's the aim. We're aiming at those players who know the moves, but not all else. Excellent. Well, of course we have a lot of coaches listening, so coaches can take a look and I, you know, as a, um, just as a teacher who teaches a lot of, uh, scholastic, um, relatively new players myself, I'm always looking for, for new material. So, I'm excited to check it out. And the, the competition itself sounds amazing. I mean, stuff like that is so important for for growing chess at the grassroots level. Yeah. I mean, you know, schools chess in, in the UK is actually, I mean, I would say it's booming. Um, the problem is what comes after that. But that's that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I've talked about it a couple of years back with Simon Williams and, of course, a couple other uh, British guests along the way. But yeah. at least if you start by growing the base, then you can address, address the middle game later. Get out of the right. opening first. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so, Daniel, um, well, two more topics, actually, because um, number one, I'm trying uh, for, for listeners, I'm, we're going to try to do a few more adult improver interviews. I know we said we wouldn't mention the coronavirus, but I know a lot of people are stuck at home. So I'm going to try to put an extra emphasis on chess improvement. So we mentioned your power play course. Um, I'm sure you get asked questions along this, these lines all the time, Daniel. But what's, you, what's your general advice for people? Let's say that the world has opened up to someone and they have two hours a day to study chess. Um, <laughs> how should they spend that time? Well, I think it's got to be a mix of playing and reflecting and studying, basically. And, and, and that's, for me, that's the, the holy trinity. Um, so, okay, we're now, we're, you know, we're kind of limited to playing online, but that's fine. I'm, I'm not sure about too much blitz. I think if possible, um, play games with a slower time limit. And the reason I say not too much blitz is that, you know, the moves just get whacked out. You blunder something, oh, whatever, you know, you, then we'll go on to the next game. I don't think there's enough consideration and focus. Whereas with a longer time control, I think moves have to be more considered. You calculate properly. You can look for plans. And when that game is over, you stop and you reflect and, you know, and try to analyze it as best you can. Um, at first, not with a computer, without a computer, but use a computer. They, you know, they might point out a few things, of course. Um, but with those slower games, I think it helps you, for example, to rehearse an opening repertoire. I think that's very important because um, that can, when you come to a slower game, that can actually help you save time. Um, so, yeah, reflecting on your games. And then studying now, where do we start? Well, yeah, I mean, every phase of the game is important, but I think it's really good just, um, I mean, this is, I'm not saying anything new here, uh, studying games by strong players with decent annotations, basically. And in that way, you can try and pick up ideas. I think it's really important. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and this is... um. 
a good a good time to do that because uh you know a lot of people generally are trying to cram chess study in where they can but now that people are actually sitting at home um for the most part it's a, a unique opportunity to really you know even maybe get a chess set out and really dig into um to some classic games well that's what i was going to say actually using a chess set <laughs> it's it's kind of gone out of fashion but um to study properly i think you need all your senses and when you're playing something over on screen, yep, it's fantastic. I'm a big fan of videos because a lot of information is condensed and, you know, you can pick up ideas very quickly. But, you know, I'm a fan of solving puzzles from a chessboard. So you might, you know, there are, there are so many sites there where you can you can solve puzzles and whatever. It's, there's, there's brilliant material online. There really is. But actually using a chessboard, um, I think, is really important. There is a massive difference between solving stuff on screen and solving stuff with real pieces and playing through games with real pieces. Because I think you, it, you get a better level of understanding playing stuff out on a board. You have to ask yourself questions. And I think there's a problem when you're just playing through games from a database, you just go blup, blup, blup. You know, it's it's too easy to play through the moves. Whereas when you're looking at something on a on a real chessboard um, and playing from a book, that's really old school. <laughs> um, you should ask yourself questions, being an active learner, basically. So why didn't he move his queen here? So what's the problem? You know, ask yourself questions. And now we have all these incredible tools that can tell you, well, he didn't move his queen there because, uh, you know, even if it's just a, a very um, simple computer program, you don't need the best software. Um, you know, it, it'll tell you why he didn't move his queen there. It'll give you some idea. Um, so, yeah, I'm a big fan. Real pieces. Okay, yeah, we have mixed, I, I would say it comes down to like 70% of people are strong advocates for that. And then a few people are like, say it doesn't matter. But um, I, I definitely think it can't, it can't hurt. Um, so last topic, Daniel, our uh, mutual friend, Geert Vandervelt of Chessable, who of course has been on the show, tipped me off that you're a, you're a keen musician as well. Uh, very, very keen. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always kind of been music in the household. And, um, when I, you know, I, I played a lot as a teenager, you know, I play, well, basically guitars, um, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, electric bass. Um, but you know, when I was traveling a lot as a chess player, I basically that kind of dropped completely, you know, so from the age of 18, um, but then when I, you know, settle down, uh, you know, I'm married with kids. Um, I, you know, I had more time and I could go back to music. Um, so I've played with so many different groups, um, whether it's in, you know, cover rock, rock bands, you know, covers bands playing, playing all those functions, you know, birthdays, weddings, whatever. Um, those kind of bands. Um, I've played in a blues band. I've played in a Latin band, playing tango and that kind of thing. Um, then I I learned the double bass, uh, which is you know completely different string bass. Um, so yeah, that's what I played in in the Latin band, and I played in a big band about twenty five of us doing kind of Sinatra stuff, uh, like a swing band. Um, what else have I done? Um, I played in a jazz trio <laughs> using, using the the, uh, the double bass, two acoustic guitars, and I was on double bass. Um, and we played, we had a residency in this really posh hotel in the centre of London. We played in the bar there once a week. Oh, cool. And that was absolutely fantastic. I just loved it. And we basically had freedom to play anything we wanted. You know, we played jazz standards. We did a lot of Latin stuff. Um, but then, you know, we get tourists coming in, um, and, they, and you know, requesting stuff. So, you know, guys would come and say, 
do you play any country music? <laughs> so, so we'd play some country music. We'd have people requesting pop songs and rock songs. And, you know, we kind of cobbled it together. And that was just brilliant fun. That's so awesome. I've played all sorts. Um, last couple of years, because like work has taken over, then it's taken a bit of a backseat, but I still play regularly, okay. you know, pub, pub gigs, you know, with a rock band uh, playing electric bass. I kind of switched from electric bass, um, electric guitar to electric bass. Um, but, sorry, go on. Oh, I yeah. could talk a lot about this. <laughs> yeah, that that just sounds like so much fun. Um, you know, that's one of my great regrets that I didn't learn um, music as, as a kid. I My mom had me take a few piano lessons and I told her they were boring and she stopped doing them. And I always, I always, uh, get, I always ask her why she would listen to a little kid about something like that. So now we've got my son taking piano lessons and he's seven. And even though his, he's hasn't shown much love for chess yet, he's, he's the music interest I think is starting to take hold a bit. Yeah. I have piano lessons too. I, I gave up after about two lessons. <laughs> yeah. It's tough when you're little. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's just technical. boring. Didn't yeah. get it. But what was great was there was always a piano in the house. Right. So I do play piano, but oh. that's completely self-taught. I mean, it's, you know, I can knock out some, some blues and jazz stuff, but that's just cause I've got an ear. Yeah. Uh, but I can't play properly, you know? Right. <laughs> reading the dots my god what's that about <laughs> <laughs> well the the music stuff sounds awesome daniel but i'm glad that your chess work is keeping you so busy that that you've had to put it on the back burner yeah well uh, you know i hope to to go back to it um once once all this madness is is over because for me music is is just an absolute passion and i love you know lots of different kinds of music and i love gigs i love live gigs I don't know how that came about, but um, it's just such a laugh to be on there on stage. And I, I tell you what it is. It's an antidote to playing chess, which I got a lot of great mates playing, you know, in the chess world. But it's competitive. You're on there on a stage and you're trying to beat each other up. And there's, you know, that's fine. But when you're you're on a stage with musicians, it's about locking together and creating something. And that is an absolute joy. Yeah. I, again, you're making me jealous. Um, did you <laughs> did you get to jam with gear at all? With who? With gear of Chessable. Have you done? Have you guys done a oh, jam no, session? Oh no! Oh, oh no! No, we've we've only uh, chatted online. But I I would absolutely love to to jam with her. You guys got to stream one something sometime. That would be that would be fun. It, it would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. But uh, for me, yeah, it's just. I mean, there are lots of people I wanted to collaborate with, with Huga as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she songs. was just on uh, Jen's podcast, Ladies Night. Right. We've been wanting to, you know, we've talked about collaborating, uh, but uh, that, you know, it's, it's just a question of time. But there are lots of other musicians that I've met, um, you know, through through chess, but, you know, around here as well. I mean, things where I'm, I live in West London, and this is a part of London, which has a real kind of, rock tradition players like um pete townsend from the who eric clapton uh the rolling stones had some of their first gigs around here and they're you you know i've kind of jammed with people in pubs and you know there's some old crusty guy and you start talking to them they go oh yeah yeah i played yeah i played with uh pete townsend in <laughs> 60 whatever oh yeah 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 i was part of a group with jeff beck and you know, they have all this incredible, all these extraordinary rock and roll stories. Um, and it's just hilarious. It really is. It's like chess in Moscow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, if you, if you grew up playing chess in Moscow, you know, you will have encountered all these people. But it's a bit like that in West London. It really is. Everyone's got a rock and roll story. That's awesome. Um, and how old are your kids, Daniel? They are 20 and 18 i had to think about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we're, we're all there they're at uni but they of course because of the the, the current crisis they're they're back home from uni as, as they've all closed down so okay yeah so, we're all we're all trying to survive in a house together which i'll tell you what <laughs> let, we'll, we're we'll again in a few weeks <laughs> see how we're all coping it's not easy <laughs> I, I'm, I'm right there with you <laughs> 
My, yeah. Mine are uh, four, how, how old are yours? Uh, four and seven. Today is my oldest uh, birthday. So happy birthday, oh. Henry, if you ever listen to this. Um, but, uh, yeah. Congratulations. Happy birthday. But uh, but yeah, and uh, and I should get to them. My daughter is hungry. Um, cool. Let's- so thank you so much, Daniel. This was awesome. Thank you, Ben. It's uh, it's fun. We sh- yeah, really enjoyed chatting. Excellent. And uh, so we'll see what happens with candidates. But listeners, you can find Daniel on YouTube, on Twitter, anywhere else. Um, they should check for you. Um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Google okay. me. You'll find him. Yeah, you can track him down. Somewhere. Okay. Well, thanks again, Daniel. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I'm wishing health and safety to to you and your family. And you and you too, Ben. And Cheers. you guys listening too. Health health and safety. Take care of yourselves. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes my producer, Matthew Passy, for his timely and capable editing, Chessable.com for their generous support of the show. But I also want to thank everyone who helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess, whether it be by telling a friend, writing a positive review on Spotify or YouTube, or we could use some new reviews on Apple Podcasts. If you're enjoying the show, please write a quick review. It helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially people who donate via paypal or patreon really help me continue to sustain and grow perpetual chess and those who donate more than five dollars a month get their name or entity's name read on the outro that's about to happen right now so i would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities for their generous support of perpetual chess they are chessable.com quality chess books the capital city chess club the apprentice twitch channel andrew bach austin clough benjamin porto kathy carr chad oliver dan o'hanlon danny davidson david schreiber i am dimitri schneider faras sawaf gary foreman greg natel greg shahadi guvin manet jens green john jernigan john rockefeller john cromarty john MacArthur, kelly palmer kevin o'callaghan lone pine chess lorraine deray Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, Moonmaster, we need a question from you. Is everything okay? We need you to send in a listener question. Peter Sadi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, and Todd Kennedy. I would also like to thank the following Rook Level supporters. They include Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Bleskachak, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am elect or possibly not I am elect. I don't know if three norms makes him an I am elect. Donnie Ariel. Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Frank Tortoris MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Murr, Jason Anfang, Jason Willem, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, J.J. Stranod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyavsky, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passaman, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, 
Richard Hollenbeck, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Kolmanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Jang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, as always, for listening and interacting with the Perpetual Chess community, and I will catch you guys next week. Music.